I've spent my whole life just being so lucky following Doug Peacock. <laughs> and Doug, I love you. And if you, and so many of us in this room are, if, if we're a friend of Doug Peacock's, then we're elevated to the status of safe. And Doug, as long as I've known you, which is 35 years, I have felt safe, whether we're in each other's presence or not. To the point where I could tell you story after story of having Doug in surgery with me, and when I woke up in the recovery room, there was no one around, but I heard the word grizzly bear, and he and the doctor were talking about bears. <laughs> it's the only time this, this one particular doctor ever let a non-medical person in the, in the surgery room. And I, as far as I know, Doug did the surgery, so I'm <laughs> Since it was on my breast, it was a little bit of a concern, but that's okay. I love you. And you have been my bedrock for decades. Your love is a love that is wild, enduring, ongoing, indomitable. Your voice continues to hold the line on an ethical stance toward life. You are our large-hearted warrior with your acute sensitivity and brilliance. Sometimes I think that gets overlooked because Doug's larger than life in his persona, whether it's Hey Duke or Peacock or Grizzlies. But it's, it's your ideas, your big ideas that are implemented and we honor you. Andrea, where are you? We honor you. <laughs> and Mark Bodine, we honor you. And we honor <laughs> This is, after all, a fundraiser. And I hope that we can all gather forth our energy in Mormon culture, we call it our tithe, and really support this extraordinary cultural resource in Livingston, Montana. I love the idea of what you're setting forth with Elk River Arts and Lectures, to bring six writers from the region and beyond to this community, and to work with the children in the schools. I just met one of them, Willow Craighead tonight, and boy, she is formidable. Brooke asked her, we were talking about books, and I asked her if she was write, a writer, and she said, I really like to read. And Brooke said, what do you read? And she looked at him and said, books. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think I have such faith in the next generation. Um, but to be able to have writers go into our schools, work with our um, young people, to help eliminate not only a literature of place, but help our students, um, our citizens, understand what it means to have a voice in place. And Brooke and I feel so fortunate to be able to um, contribute tonight. And so Mark and Andrea, we have a check for you for $500, and it's being matched by the Compton Foundation two to one. So that's, it's a small start, but um, I hope you're very good. And I remember John Nichols um, once said, money is energy, and I love that. And there's a whole lot of energy here, and it's why I think we all feel so blessed to be part of the Northern Rockies. What I want to talk about tonight is the art of revolution. And my friends who are here, and you know I don't do this easily. Um, I wish I did, but it's really a pathology. You know, I don't know if it was starting out with a lisp when I was young, but you know, speaking does not come naturally to me. And, you know, usually what I present is a polished voice that's either on the page or that I have really um, labored over. And I'm not doing that tonight. And it's my own act of respect for Rick Bass, for Quammen, Betsy and her family, for Marsha, for Teresa, for Doug, for Brooke, um, for all the people that I love who are here tonight and you know who you are. 
Because I think what's more interesting than polished prose on the page uh, is the process by which we live and by what catches us, what moves us, what takes us to that next level of thought. You know, Doug, when you said, you know, one of your friends in the patriarchy said, you know, I don't think I'll hear anything new. I think that is the fear of every writer, is that you're just telling the same story. And I was talking to one of my friends who is a writer, and she said, you know, I'm writing the same story for the fourth and fifth time. And I think because his writers were flawed, and so we work with our demons, whatever they are, until we finally get it right. And I don't think I've ever gotten it right. And um, so it's, it's the attempt. But what I want to share with you in the next um, 30 or 40 minutes or so, and I'll make it shorter, 30 minutes, is just what are the conversations that we're not having? And in the last few months, I just want to share with you four episodes where I felt I heard a different conversation. And it had to do with the art of revolution. The first is a film that I saw in January at Sundance called Pandora's Promise. Have any of you seen it? Um, I, it will come, I suspect, to Bozeman, possibly to Livingston. Um, I'm hoping it's coming to Jackson or to Moab. The director's name is Robert Stone, and he has written, he's, um, I would say he's an edgy filmmaker. He wrote about the Bikini Atoll, he wrote about the first Earth Day, he wrote about, um, Patty Hearst and the Palestinian Liberation Army, and he's a longtime environmentalist. Pandora's Promise is what he calls a conversion story, and it's about five environmentalists who have now changed and are advocating for nuclear energy. I went and saw it. I was dubious. Um, many of you know my history. Nine women in my family have all had mastectomy, seven are dead as a result of nuclear testing. Um, by the end of the film, the question that I had was, what if 30 years of anti-nuclear activism, what if I've been wrong? That's healthy. And I was there to review it for The Nation magazine. And I wrote the review, and my lead was, what if everything that I have thought for 30 years as an anti-nuclear activist was wrong? And then I outlaid, and then I laid out the arguments. The nation, and it took probably, I'd say, two weeks of exhaustive research. I wasn't sleeping. I mean, it really haunted me. And I knew that there was a lot at stake. I can't say that this film changed my mind. It did not, but it opened it, and that's significant. And I've no longer been satisfied with the answer that I've been given. If we are done with fossil fuels, um, What's next? What are the alternatives? We have a son from Rwanda. Um, I no longer have the naivete that I once had as an American. You know, what about energy poor com countries? What's our solution? So I'm thinking about these things. I got a note, and this is between us, um, from the editor of The Nation, and she said, we can't, what she said was, Terry, this is a beautifully written essay. Then you know you're in trouble, right? <laughs> and she said, but unfortunately, we can't publish this. And this was like the fourth essay that I've written, the same thing. This is a beautifully written essay, but I'm sorry, we can't publish this. So um, she said, I think that you're very naive and you really don't have your facts. I did have my facts, but they didn't want to hear what I had to say. And she said, but we have um, a writer who is very experienced in these issues, and he'd be happy to go strike this for you, and we can still use your voice. <laughs> and I said, no, thank you. And um, we concluded the, the conversation. I told a mentor of mine who's 80 years old, Linda Asher, former editor of The New Yorker, or a fiction editor of The New Yorker, one of the smartest people I know, and she lives in New York, she knows the editor of The Nation, she's been a lifelong subscriber. I told her I was upset, and she said, why don't you talk to that man? Why don't you talk to the writer that they want to pair you with? And I said, Linda, I'm not interested in having a ghostwriter. She said, you don't need to have a ghostwriter. Why don't you just sit down and see what he has to say? Maybe you did get your facts wrong. Maybe there's a deeper way you can look at this. I trusted her, that's why we have elders. 
And I met with Mark Herzog in San Francisco for three hours. And it was one of the most exciting conversations I've ever had. And what we decided was, no, I don't need a ghost writer. But I do need a writer to have a conversation with. So what if you go see the film, and I'll see it again, and we have a conversation on the page. And I'll have one color of ink, you'll have another color of ink, and where we agree, we'll have a third color of ink. And we'll provide a different kind of forum for conversation. And that's basically what we did. And it was a four-month project. I can't tell you how wonderful it was to really be stretched and pushed. And, um, and I think the great thing that I have loved about this is that everyone is upset with me. <laughs> I think being 57 years old is that it doesn't matter. Because what I'm interested in is the conversation. I did, I did my best. And I just want to read with, um, for you uh, some excerpts, if you don't mind. I belong to a clan of one-breasted women. My mother, grandmother, and six aunts of a high mastectomy, seven are dead. So begins the epilogue of my memoir, Refuge. As Utah's residents of the Atomic West, we are Hibakusha, explosion-affected people bound by the wind. Half of my family has died from cancers that I believe were a result of radioactive fallout caused by above-ground nuclear explosions in the Nevada desert from 1945 to 62. In declassified materials from the Atomic Energy Commission, Mormons and Indians living downwind of the blast were considered a low-use segment of the population. In the eyes of our government, my people were expendable. Almost $800 million has been paid in compensation to downwinders as an acknowledgement and apology by the government for negligence against its citizens in the testing of nuclear weapons during the Cold War. My family's story is just one in an anthology of thousands. So when I say that Robert Stone's film Pandora's Promise challenged my thinking after 30 years of anti-nuclear activism, it is not a small statement. This crack in my own thinking is heightened by the fact that I am now watching my extended community of plants, animals, rocks, rivers, and human beings being ravaged by the oil and gas industry, be it fracking or the raising of vulnerable wildlands. For me, this film's strength was not that it changed my mind, which it did not, but that it expanded it, which it did. I'm interested in having an open conversation about nuclear energy. We know must, we, we must wean ourselves of fossil fuels, so what are the alternatives? Are renewable energy sources enough for the energy poor around the world? And so begins the conversation. We screened it at Dartmouth College. It was fascinating. There were those activists from the Yankee nuclear power plant that were absolutely outraged that this film would even be made. There were those, the pro-nuclear um, scientists, that were thrilled that finally they could come clean with what they believed to be true. Gus Speth, from, um, who started NRDC, was there from, he was dean of the Yale School of Forestry. He came and said um, that many of us who have been carefully studying this issue don't believe that it will require producing more energy. And he wanted a more informed uh, conversation about energy efficiency. There was a gentleman um, from, who was part of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission who said saying that nuclear energy can solve climate change is like saying that caviar will solve world hunger. So it was a spirited conversation. Um, I found, and I want to share this with you, Michael Toten, whom I regard as one of the world's leading thinkers about green technologies. He set forth this criteria when exploring energy alternatives. One, is it economically affordable, including the poor? Two, is it safe throughout its entire life cycle? Three, is it clean throughout its entire lifespan? Four, is the risk low and manageable? Is it resilient? and flexible to volatility? Is it ecologically sustainable? Is it environmentally benign? If it fails, does it fail gracefully, not catastrophically? Does it rebound easily and swiftly from failures? Is it an uninteresting target for malicious disruption off the radar of terrorists and military planners? And lastly, this is the last closing paragraph. Humans are now the most influential geomorphic agent on the planet's surface. We are living in the Anthropocene epoch. Some see this development as reason for restraint, for taking into consideration the health of diverse ecosystems, human and wild. Others, like the converts in this film, assert the inevitability of human expansion and technology, the only cure for our collective hunger for more and more energy. For my part, 
I submit that the solutions to climate change are as much about will and evolutionary consciousness as they are about technological choices. It's also about humility. Humans are not the God species. We are simply one more breathing, struggling species, one that has been gifted with a large imagination that has a propensity to shape the environment around us. Our task is not to unleash a box of demons upon the world. It is to nurture a space for serious dialogue about our energy choices, while employing our imagination and sustaining what we should love and cherish most, which is life. So that's the first um, sight of disruption that I would bring to you tonight, Pandora's Promise, and I urge you to see it and bring that conversation home. I don't know. That's what I keep saying. I don't know. We have never been here before. The second site of, destruction, or of uh, disruption was Dartmouth College. I had a student named Troy Dilden. And what he told me was that when he applied for Dartmouth and was asked about identity, he marked white. Clearly, he was not white. And his mother was from Mexico. She was adopted by an Anglo family who told her she was white and she believed it. He was mar she married an another Anglo and Troy said he never really gave his identity much thought except for that he never felt accepted where he was. When he came to Dartmouth he was told that he was black, that he was Asian, that he was Hispanic, that he was Persian. And finally he thought, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I am. But what he started hearing was a lot of homophobic statements, a lot of racist, racist statements. And he, with a group of 14 other students who had similar concerns about Dartmouth, decided to take a stand. And at Dartmouth uh, College, they have what's called dimensions. It's a welcome show where they invite those that have been um, admitted to Dartmouth but haven't made a decision whether or not to say yes to come to the college and hear everything that's great about it. These 15 students stormed the Dimensions Assembly with a mantra that Dartmouth has a problem. And then they threw out um, sexual assault statistics. Dartmouth has a problem and threw out uh, racial statistics. Dartmouth has a problem and threw out homophobic examples. To say the least, um, the people at Dartmouth were not pleased. <laughs> and those who were making a decision were both confused, terrified, and some were impressed. Um, what happened was that the 15 students became the target for the very thing that they were protesting. And hate mail ensued, um, terrifying statements resulted, and a crisis emerged. The president, Carol Holt, met with faculty and um, staff during that meeting, the 15 students came and said, we need a conversation that we aren't having. And the president said, we're having that conversation now. And they said, really? Have you seen what has been written at, on this campus? And they said, yes, we're aware of it. And they said, maybe you're aware of it, but maybe you haven't really heard it. And more to the point, maybe you haven't felt it. And they took those horrible, which I would not even repeat here, racist, abusive remarks that were very personal, and they gave them to the president, the provost, the deans of the colleges, and had them stand and read it out loud. <laughs> By the end, the faculty, the president, they were all in tears. For the first time in Dartmouth's history, classes were canceled the next day. And the school embarked on an all day of reflection. Did it change Dartmouth? I don't know. Did it change the conversation? Most certainly. A site of disruption. The third site of disruption. <coughs> Naomi Natali read Philip Gorovich's book. We wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families about Rwanda. How many of you have read that? It's a powerful book. It's a life-changing book. She, in her early 30s, had not heard about the genocide in Rwanda, 
had not heard that a million Tutsis were murdered by hand in a hundred days, and she wondered why not. And then as she started thinking about other atrocities around the world, other genocides, whether it was in Sudan, whether it was in the Congo, or now in Syria, she thought as an artist, what can I do to change this conversation? And she had this vision that she would open it up to people all over the world, beginning in New Mexico, and, and ask, will you make a bone with me? And as soon as we have a million bones, we'll take those bones and we'll lay those bones down on the mall in Washington, D.C., on the most powerful public space in the world. And last weekend, Naomi Natali and thousands of other people laid down a million bones on the mall in Washington at the foot of the Capitol of the United States of America. Did anyone see this? These are the stories that go unnoticed. This visual representation, she thought, could wake people up. And what she could do as an artist was to keep and to make a disturbance. I want, I wrote something for you today. And I just, again, it's not the polished work, but this is what we do in community. And each of us in our own way with the gifts that are ours. And I was telling my friend the other day who is so, she is so talented on so many different levels. And she said, I just can't decide where to put my energy. I've never had that problem because I can only do one thing. <laughs> and so um, I want to share this with you. And it's, it's called One Million Bones. We came in white to honor the bones. Thousands of people dressed in white, making a pilgrimage to the most sacred public space in America to lay these bones down in the name of those who have died through genocide. One million bones. One million bones speaking to us through the Congo, through Rwanda, through Sudan, Syria, Cambodia, Burma, East Timor, the Holocaust, and all those through time who have perished through war. Never again was the mantra written on our collective hearts. We came in white to honor the bones. It began with rain. In rain, we found our place among the pile of bones. Who could blame the dead among us for weeping? They were no longer invisible. In ritualistic fashion, we were paired with another, each of us carrying eight bones. From the edge of the mall, we found our place, and in pairs, we walked inward toward the center path and laid down our bones. We paused, we turned, walked back together more as we were met with two others walking toward the center with bones. Repetition is spiritual, says artist Kiki Smith, and so the work of the day began. We are what is left. We are what remains. We are walking trauma. We resist the legacy of loneliness, speaks the poet Hakim, as we blanket the mall with bones. Killing any one of us kills all of us. We are not survivors. We are all the same. The man with that I walk with is from Rwanda. He is dressed in white. On his left hand is a scar from a machete. We walk in silence, one million bones, one million Tootsies slaughtered by hand by neighbors. Twibuki, we remember. Is repetition spiritual or is it genocide? Call it genocide in Rwanda. This man is our son. Another man is a potter from Mayberry, India, in Indiana, who heard of this project and devoted one day a week for a year to making clay bones, shaping them, firing them, imagining them here. He is here, his bones are here. He is paired with another and lays them down, the bones made by many. Barbara Johnson is a school teacher. She's made over 5,000 bones of her own with hands, the hands of her students in Maryland. They walk together, each of them changed by the bone they created. A dream of a dreamer is about to happen, says the Rabbi Bruce Lastig of Washington, D.C. That dreamer is Naomi Natali, who has held this vision with others since March 2010. It was the story of Rwanda that haunted her. In times of war, create something, she said. Natala saw one billion million bones laid across the mall, a declaration of resistance insistence that the bones of the dead will not only be remembered but recognized. When you make a bone with your own hands, she says, your mind begins to change. Over the past three years, over 2,000 schools across America have participated in this action, creating an awareness of genocide and atrocities with artists, teachers, community groups, and individuals from all 50 states. Individuals from around the world also helped in this creative action to end suffering. And UPS, 
with its hundreds of drivers, agreed to pick up any bone made in the United States and deliver them to the mall on Washington without charge. And so, in a sea of white and a sea of brown, we laid down bones. The bones are beautiful. Each individual bone is someone. Together they are beautiful, says Naomi Natalia. The rabbi continued, we share the same bones. We are all fashioned from the same body. We are bound by bones. He paused, looked out of the audience and said, today we lay down the bones on the conscience of the world. Who cares? We did. Thousands cared. Returning again and again to the bone piles, picking out a femur, an ulna, a hand, or a skull, scapulas, ribs resembling commas, and I thought about what is held inside is protected from bones as a parenthesis. Eight bones at a time carried across the lawn as a wave of white moved from the center to the periphery of the mall, just the opposite of how change organically occurs, moving from the edges to the center. A blanket of bones began to cover the green, and it was beautiful in its disturbance. Two by two, we engaged in a walking meditation, the carrying of bones, the laying down of bones, from nine in the morning till six at night. The closest I came to laying bones down was with my uncle in Kigali, where newly found bones were being buried by their beloved, says my Rwandan friend, our son. As he walked toward the center, our eyes facing forward again, with our hand-picked bones resting in our arms. Today, I can now bury them, he said. What began as metaphor became a gesture. These bones are no longer made from plaster or clay or paper mache. They are infused with the marrow of memory. John Dow, one of the lost boys of Sudan, speaks, I was so honored to lay the first bone. It was not a bone from the United States. It was not a bone about or from Naomi Natali. For me, this bone was close to me. It was the bone of my brother, my sister, killed in Sudan. I must take care of it and lay it down with respect. He paused. Two and a half million people in Sudan have died. How many bones, I ask you? Each one of us has 206 bones in our bodies. Do the math. Two and a half million people. How many bones? On this mall today, bone to bone, only 4,000 people. A million bones. The question before me, he says, as I knelt down to place this bone, is a simple one. What are we doing here? John Dow allows me to answer this question for myself. I am here because I have seen thousands of bones exposed, exhumed, and speaking in Rwanda. I am here because I love a Rwandan man named Louis Gakuma, who is now part of our family. I am here because the blood and bones of Indian people are buried in the history of these United States. I am here because my friend Doug Peacock has laid down his own bones in a ghost herd in Yellowstone. I am here because my husband Brooke fashioned a bone that belongs to a bird and asks us to think of the others beyond our own species who have also been slayed. I am here because I believe the art of revolution is an internal revolution that radiates downward, outward. And I am here because I belong to a foundation who helped fund this project and I needed to see how a proposal written on paper becomes a pathway to peace. These bones are inconvenient and uncomfortable, says Naomi Natali. It is so easy to decide this work is for others. But maybe, just maybe, it could take us carrying human bones to make us aware of how we are all connected as we feel the weight of this responsibility. The work we decide is not for us, is less for our children. I wonder on Monday if when Congress gathers, if they will see the one million bones. Worse, if they will even notice that their landscape had shifted. The last site of disturbance is one called Genesis, and it's by the photographer Sebastio Salgado. How many of you are familiar with his work? He is a profound photographer who has spent most of his life on taking images of war. What he had decided now as a man in his 70s is that he needs to be healed. And so he has set his gaze, his lens, on the last remaining wild areas, the animals and the people who remain. And he said it is selfish. He said that he has seen in his lifetime as a photographer of war, epic sorrow and suffering, epic compassion and empathy, 
an epic love. But now he needs to turn it on himself. What he says is Genesis is a quest for the world as it was, as it was formed, as it evolved, as it existed for millennia, before modern life accelerated and began distancing us from the very essence of our being. It is a journey of landscapes, seascapes, animals, and peoples that have so far escaped the long reach of today's world. And it is a testimonial that our planet still harbors vast and remote regions where nature reigns in silent and pristine majesty. What struck me is that he dared to use the word pristine majesty. Because if those of us within the wilderness community are told that to even speak the word pristine is an act of nostalgia. I love that he says, we are living traversing in an important moment of our planet. The photographs are my way of capturing and comprehending our conscience and consciousness. He says, photography is my pen, my tool, as he tells his story, his autobiography as a human being. He says, look at my hand. And the image that he presents is the hand of a lizard. To stay, to not avert our gaze, to not walk away, to call for the conversation that we are not having, to listen in times of war, to make something, to agree to do the hard work ahead, the real work of loving the world, the art of revolution. And in closing, <laughs> from when women were birds, my voice rises again and again in beauty within the wonder and awe of the spectacle. An exaltation of larks, the murmuration of starlings, a murder of crows, a parliament of owls. And then in the privacy of truth, there is still the repeating courage of one hermit thrush hidden in the woods, singing between intervals of thunder. It is not in sorrow that I am moved to speak or act, but in the beauty of what remains. An albatross on Midway Atoll, dead and decomposing, is now a nest of feathers, harboring plastic from the Pacific gyre of garbage swirling in the sea. We can kneel in horror and beg forgiveness, or we can turn away. But the albatross crying overhead, buoyed up by the breeze, is suspended in the air by her vast bridge of wings. She is the one who beckons us to respond. How shall we live? I want to feel both the beauty and the pain of the age we are living in. I want to survive my life without becoming numb. I want to speak and comprehend words of wounding without having these words become the landscape where I dwell. I want to possess a light touch that can elevate darkness to the realm of stars. Disturbance. What is time, sacred time, but the acceleration of consciousness, there are so many ways to change the sentences we have been given. We cannot do it alone. We do it alone. How shall we live? Once upon a time, when women were birds, there was the simple understanding that to sing at dawn and to sing at dusk was to heal the world through joy. The birds still remember what we have forgotten, that the world is meant to be celebrated. Thank you.